I've been so focused lately on Star Trek Discovery and even on Lower Decks because that ended not that long ago. I keep having to remind myself that Star Trek Picard is still out there. Like we're going to get other seasons of it. And I'm, it's just amazing to me that we have so much Star Trek and, and Strange New Worlds is going to start shooting at some point here soon. There's just so much. I love it, Dan. Yeah, it's crazy. 2020 has seen three Star Trek series airing that we've enjoyed new episodes of. Like, and, and two of those are totally new series that we hadn't seen before. How crazy is that? I know. This is like a dream come true. I never would have imagined this, but I'll take it. I mean, I'm just even thinking about how 15 years ago when Enterprise ended, I was like, well, I'm sure one day, one day, maybe we'll get another Star Trek series. And here we sit with multiple <laughs> in the same year. It's like, <laughs> this is fantastic. So welcome everyone to Positively Trek. I'm Bruce Gibson. And with me, as he always is, is Dan Gunther. Yeah, I'm always here, just sitting ready to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> you guys do not realize how easy it is to record with Dan, because anytime I feel like recording, I just jump on the mic, and Dan's always sitting there. I can just do a show. I don't even have to tell him, hey, you want to do it now? He's just always available. Yep. I just, I when I'm not podcasting, I'm sitting in front of my computer waiting for the next opportunity to talk about Star Trek, usually. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also have a guest with us from the great podcast, Trek Untold. If you haven't heard of it, you need to check it out. We're going to discuss it on today's episode. But we have the host of that podcast and the creator of it, Matthew Kaplowitz. I'm sorry, is this a Star Trek podcast? I thought this was the Police Academy Appreciation Society. <laughs> <laughs> I was prepared to talk about Steve Gutenberg. I'm not ready to handle Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> I, we'll have to have a have a talk with our our agents. That's uh, that that's happened far too much this month, Bruce. This is this is becoming a regular thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, Matthew, thank you for joining us here on the show. Just we're going to talk to you a little bit about your fandom and and your podcast and such. But give us just a brief idea before we go into the news about what Trek Untold is about. So Trek Untold is a weekly interview series that I do. It's available on all the podcast formats and also on my YouTube channel, Nerd News Today. And what it is, is each week we talk with a different contributor to the Star Trek universe. So it can be one week a character actor, it can be a stunt performer, it can be a behind the scenes person, like a writer, a director, someone from the VFX crew, a post-production crew. It could be comic book writers. We've had composers come on the show. Basically, it's anybody whose name is not in the opening credits is someone I want to talk to on Trek Untold. Nice. Well, we want to check that out and we'll t discuss that a little more here, but we want to go through a few news items. And there's not a lot going on in the news. I mean, when you think about we're getting all this Star Trek as we're talking about, sometimes there's weeks where you just look and you're like, well, there's not a whole lot going on. But as I alluded to earlier about Star Trek Picard, we did find out that uh, they are getting ready for next year to start shooting not just season two, but apparently also season three. They'll go from one to the other in their production schedule. And this I found in an article from redshirtsalwaysdie.com, which I'd never heard of before. <laughs> Very credible name. Exactly. So I don't know how credible this is, but uh, apparently we are getting two seasons in production next year. Yeah, absolutely. This looks really interesting. So they're saying that uh, it's from an interview with Evan Evagora, uh, who plays Elnor in Star Trek Picard. And he said that uh, he was able to confirm that the series would start filming season two in January of 2021 for another 10 episode second season. Uh, and filming would end in June of 2021. At that point, filming for season three would begin in that same month and run through to November of 2021. Now, of course, we do know that filming schedules change and, and dates slip and that sort of thing. So probably not the final dates that those will begin and end on. But uh, interesting that, you know, they're they're being ambitious. They're filming both of those seasons back to back, it looks like. And do you guys happen to know offhand when uh, Star Strange New Worlds is going to start shooting? I haven't heard anything. I think we've heard 2021 from various people, but no hard date or anything like that. Because the reason I ask is, is my, my main thought behind why they might be doing seasons two and three of Picard together is because of that rumor that there might be some kind of like shared universe event happening in the Star Trek world. So I'm wondering if there's going to be some proximity between those two things, because maybe Strange New Worlds at some point may have some convergence with the events of Picard somehow, some temporal anomaly. I don't know. 
But do you guys remember hearing that rumor? There's supposed to be some like big shared universe thing going on. I hadn't heard that myself, but but that's interesting. I could see like each series is searching for a particular infinity stone. And wait, no, sorry, I'm getting my <laughs> getting my streams crossed there. But yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that. I did hear that at one point. Yeah, like a shared universe of the something going on between the series. I I did I do recall hearing something about that. But again, as you pointed out, it just being rumor. And I'm assuming that Strange New Worlds will uh, production will be in Toronto. And I'm guessing that right after Discovery finishes production on season four, they'll go right into Strange New Worlds at the same time that Picard is being shot in Los Angeles. I mean, it's it's all over the place, but really, who knows? I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't just bring the Picard crew up to Canada for a little bit. I'm sure none of them would mind that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to see how it's going to turn out and see if there actually going to be is start to be any maybe hints of possible crossovers happening. Well, let me ask you this: Would you like that? I'm curious to see if it'll happen. I don't. I, I guess I'll like it more once I know what's going on because crossover events are always kind of iffy. Uh, you know, these days I feel like entertainment has kind of mastered the whole crossover thing we've seen it happen in so many other places besides just disney's universes other 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 places who've done it before so i think if they do it right it could be interesting uh i mean ultimately if they're going to do it it has to involve some kind of temporal timey-wimey stuff if you will um so that part has me worried has, has me a little bit concerned but yeah i can definitely see them kind of doing some hunt for some sort of macguffin some sort of infinity stone in the star trek equivalent of it i don't know dan what do you think i'm kind of on the opinion of not really wanting a crossover like full force but maybe it kind of like something light maybe there's a episode where it connects to another episode of another series yeah i i'm not entirely enthusiastic about a big like you know all of the teams coming together and 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 some big thing like that i do like when you get the feeling of a more cohesive universe i think for example in the latest episode of star trek discovery they talk about the koat milat the romulan warrior nuns and that sort of thing so bringing elements over and and you know self-referencing and that kind of thing i think filling out that universe and making it feel like a real thing i think that's a good thing i feel like when they bring too many characters together through weird and convoluted means then i i I, you know without knowing what it looks like i don't want to prejudge but it does run the risk of the small universe syndrome like everybody knowing everybody and and something like that so it's a fine line to walk if it's something they can do really well and they have a really great idea for it sure but uh it's something i'm a little wary of for sure maybe they can do some crossover between the different series that all relate to that voyager episode of threshold and really build off of that episode. You can have in different series, Threshold 2, Threshold 3, Threshold 4, and everybody's making lizard babies. Oh, God. <laughs> I'd be down for that. I'm into that. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, guy. Do you guys ever read any of the IDW Star Trek comics? All oh, yes. the time. We cover Absolutely. them on the show, yeah. All right, so then you guys would probably remember then that there was the, uh, I think it was the Q Conflict miniseries. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that Absolutely. was actually basically showing how you could pull off a Star Trek crossover with multiple shows in different timelines, because we had the original series and TNG, Voyager and DS9 crews together taking on the various uh, godlike entities in the Star Trek universe. Mm-hmm. So it's not impossible. They've, they've definitely planted some seeds with that. Absolutely. See, and, and that to me is something like I, th- I think that made for a great comic series parts that i rolled my eyes at a little bit but you know that's that's good star trek you roll your eyes at it every once in a while i would question them doing that as like a movie event or a tv show event it might it 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 kind of would cross the line into i'm supposed to take this too seriously now if that makes sense but as a comic i loved it i thought it was great yeah i definitely don't see it working in any other format besides comics but it does kind of show us that you know these godlike characters, Q, Trelane, uh, they all have the ability to go back and forth in time and space anyway. So what stopped them from maybe being the cause of this? Yeah, and that series to me came across as very standalone. Like it doesn't have any impact on any other storylines or any other comic series or any novels or anything like that. It's kind of its own thing. Plus the fact that they don't remember what happened. So, you know, it's that cheap trick of, oh, you bring them all together and then you send them back and no one remembers. So it's like, so what was the point? It's like almost like the year of hell. <laughs> we're still in the year of hell <laughs> <laughs> exactly too real <laughs> too real well uh there's a podcast out there called the delta flyers and i'm sure you guys are familiar with it where we have robbie mcneil or robert mcneil and garrett wong talking about 
episodes of Star Trek Voyager and they're revisiting it and they revisited Threshold of all things, which I mentioned earlier. And Kate Mulgrew joins them for the discussion. Now, I haven't listened to that episode yet. Have you guys listened, first of all, to that podcast, uh, any of their shows, and have you listened to this one? I'm a regular listener of the Delta Flyers. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a, a few weeks behind on all of my podcasts, so I haven't gotten to that episode yet. I just listened to their one uh, on Prototype, I think, which was also really good. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited to get to this one. I've resisted the urge to move it up in my podcast queue to listen to it right away because I, I want to listen to them in order. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how this one goes. <laughs> I'm actually currently uh, doing a side-by-side rewatch of the original series and TNG chronologically. So I'm still uh, just finished season one of original. I'm on the verge of season one of TNG. So uh, what I plan on doing is basically listening to those Delta Flyer episodes once I get to Voyager so I can kind of get the behind the scenes stuff of that and be a little bit more fresh and up to date on it. Yeah, it sounds quite interesting. I haven't listened to it yet, uh, but I do want to listen to it. I've, I've read some little outtakes here. Where it seems as if Kate Mulgrew is questioning, seriously, has this episode ever won any episodes? This is highly regarded. And they're just laughing like, no. But it did win a, an award. I think it was for makeup or something. Like that. They had to tell or at least got nominated. So uh, I think it would be quite interesting to listen to. I know that Robert McDeal talks about all the makeup that he went through and the tongue and how he dealt with the tongue falling out. It had jello on it. And so he's getting that taste of jello in his mouth. I mean, the whole thing is just sounds so disgusting to me. I could not handle that. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Like, I, I don't know if you've revisited that episode at all recently or like even within the last couple of years, but it's, uh, it's even weirder than I remembered. <laughs> Amazingly. <laughs> I don't know what's weirder that or sub Rosa. I mean, there's so many like really weird, bizarre ones in Star Trek history, but those two right there are, are definitely top tier level uh, bizarre ones. I don't even know if I want to go back and watch Threshold anytime soon. Usually <laughs> when we talk about an episode, I go, oh, you know, I kind of want to go back and rewatch that. Even talking about Threshold right now, I, I'm just, I don't think I want to go back and rewatch that anytime soon. But if I listen to the Delta Flyers, I probably will for sure. It's been a long year, Bruce. Don't torture yourself more than you have to. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's wrong with me. I just want to be punished all the time. <laughs> Okay, so speaking of Voyager, now this part to me is a little interesting. So, you know, John Delancey plays Q. Well, he also likes to do, I guess, cooking shows. He's got his own like YouTube channel, and he's making pizza. And he's preparing this for Thanksgiving. Of course, we just had Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and he re- released this video, and he goes out in his yard, and he's like a brick oven or something out there. And guess who shows up to help him finish making the pizza? But Robert Picardo and Kate Mulgrew. So we have Captain Janeway and the doctor helping Q making pizza on this YouTube video. And I mean, it's just kind of nice, you know, just seeing them hanging out and making pizza together. But yeah, if you go on YouTube and look for John Delancey's channel, you would find this. It's also on johndelancey.com. And you can see them making pizza together because I'm sure in your guy's mind at some point, while watching Voyager, you thought, wouldn't it be interesting if Q and Janeway and the Doctor made pizza together? Well, now here's your opportunity to see it. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize that's what 2020 needed, was was just sitting and watching an omnipotent being, a holographic doctor, and a starship captain making pizza. Like, I mean, we got we got Riker making pizza in Star Trek Picard. That almost feels just like an amuse bouche, a little a little preview of of the awesomeness that this is. So <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I didn't even think about Star Trek Picard, but you're right. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> and I just want to remind everybody at home that Dan, uh just your Thanksgiving is a little bit early. You might want to just move it back a few weeks, perhaps. But uh yeah, yep. besides that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I found it kind of funny that the EMH likes the most pungent smelling pizza of all because he went for the Gorgonzola and Fig. <laughs> like he, he can't smell it. No wonder he's fine with that one. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and now I'm craving pizza. But, you know, Matthew, you have it best. You have the best pizza in New York. So I'm not there. So unfortunately, I can't have really good pizza. I, I never had uh, Southern pizza before. I'm curious what it tastes like. 
I don't think I've ever even had Southern pizza being in Atlanta. I avoid it. <laughs> like, is it just ketchup on a roll or something? Like, what do they do? <laughs> I think it's called Papa John's. <laughs> uh, because no um, pizza is complete without dipping sauce. Exactly. Exactly. Now, we've got a few uh, pizza, New York style pizza places around here that 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 are up there. I, I would give them cred on that. So. Are you counting Sparrows as part of that? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> that reference I do get. <laughs> <laughs> we have Sparrows in Canada. <laughs> I will tell you one time years ago, I was on a business trip to New York and I went to a pizzeria and got two slices and just because I was craving it and you walk by and you know, you smell it and all that. And I was like, I'm going to have that for dinner tonight. My boss got mad at me when I returned back to the office and he put in my expense report and she's like, we don't send it to send you to new york and pay for your meal at a, a pizza place you have to go to a fine restaurant i'm like i'll eat what i want to eat and let me tell you this was fine pizza <laughs> <laughs> you remember where you went i have to critique your pizza choice uh i don't recall but uh i can find out later I, if I, i'll have to give it some thought I, I definitely recommend any listeners out there next time you go to new york whenever that's safe enough to do that check out uh, artichoke pizza i think that's one of my favorites okay where's hmm. that there's a few of them, but the one I like is on McDougal Street, which is a little bit near the village area, that kind of spot. Um, that's probably one of my favorite slices in terms of like size, flavor, texture. It's like that's the one that to me is like the New York slice. <sighs> OK, COVID stop. I got to get to New York. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm in actually the meantime, writing this down. I, I don't know when <laughs> I'm going to get to New York, but I got a whole list. You let me know. I'll hook you up. <laughs> I'm usually in New York several times a year. So after COVID, I'll, I'm that, I'll hit that place for sure. Absolutely. Like basically the key is don't waste your time in Little Italy. In all honesty, don't bother spending any time over there. Don't spend your time on 42nd or 34th Street, all the tourist areas. You got to really go down to like the Chelsea, the Soho areas. That's where the good stuff's hiding. Yeah, I went to Little Italy once and I was just not impressed. So I mean, it's fine. Little Italy's fine. I mean, it's fine yeah. <laughs> it's about yeah. the best review i can say for it there's yeah. good stuff there but i mean at this point uh you know if you want to get the good stuff it's hiding in other places okay i, I gotta get my mind off of pizza now because i'm craving it so welcome to, <laughs> welcome to positively pizza mm. oh my Ooh. gosh that's so funny i just said to it's my wife spell. yesterday i i almost feel like doing a podcast about pizza and there it is positively pizza that's what it would be called <laughs> it's a sequel to this okay moving oh, you're on welcome <laughs> thank you uh <laughs> noble toys they're launching new action figures of Star Trek. And now these are called wait, these are these aren't that impressive, like, ooh, fine looking action figures to display. I mean, you still might want to display them, but they're called bendy figs. And so you can take Spock and he's a little figure that you can bend and pose in whatever way you want to. And you also have Kirk and Yuhora and McCoy. So, Dan, do you think you're going to bendy fig with these guys? I don't know that I'm going to pick any of these up. Uh, I do have to say they're they're not bad looking. I think the likenesses are pretty good, with the notable exception of William Shatner as Captain Kirk, because that seems to be just a a, a line that you know, a certain level of toy manufacturer can't seem to cross. They can't seem to get his likeness right. I don't know if it's because it's too generic or what, but, you know, Spock, McCoy, and Uhura, they they definitely, I, I think they have distinctive features that they're able to, like, kind of latch onto one or two characteristics and get those right. And then, you know, the rest of your brain kind of says, oh, yeah, that looks like them. But this Kirk one just does not look good at all. <laughs> yeah, what is it with Kirk? I don't know why they can't get Kirk right. Or maybe they just I've, don't I've want I've even Wimstad. seen, like, yeah, I've, I've even seen, like, high-end figures that just can't quite get that look right. Yeah, and Matthew, I just sent you the link in the chat for you to check it out. I mean, these things remind me of Gumby, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> the, the minute you mentioned new Trek figures, I went right to Google. Don't you worry about that. I found them right away. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think this is a great Captain Kirk if you want your Captain Kirk to look like Ryan Stiles. <laughs> there you go. I knew I knew this guy from somewhere. <laughs> Whose ship is it anyway? I, I'm actually, yeah, I, I'm... I'm actually a really, really big Star Trek toy collector. Uh, I have a ton of Star Trek toys from Playmates, Diamond Select, Pr McFarlane, uh, pretty much anybody that's out there. Um, I also have a pretty decent collection of Star Trek prototype action figures. So I'm definitely curious about this because Bendy figures tend to suck. Like they're they're usually meant to be like the affordable option for 
pharmaceutical stores, if you will. Uh, they're not really anything you're going to see in like a proper toy store. I feel like uh, if there are any more that exist these days, but uh, you know, Bendy's have kind of not the greatest history to begin with, but all things considered, if the actual product, if the actual produced versions look as good as the protos, I'd say they're not terrible because Bendy figures tend to not have great likenesses to begin with. Their paint is usually terrible. It's just the nature of the toys. Um, but to be quite fair, I mean, they're not the worst looking out there and they also got Uhura. So, I mean, they got a female as well as part of the launch, which uh, I think that's also pretty notable. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep my eyes open. If the price is right, they may be joining my collection, uh, but I'm not going to hunt these things down too hard. That's for sure. Yeah. But you know what? These things are fun in the bathtub because I remember as a kid <laughs> having a little like bendy fig stuff in the bathtub and they don't get ruined, you know, because they, they bend and they're glossy and Yeah. I'm, but I don't take baths anymore. I find baths to be kind of disgusting. I don't know. I mean, I know this show is about Star Trek, but do you guys take baths? <laughs> Not, <laughs> Not very bath often. Time. <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> I'm a shower guy. That's all. Yeah, I'm, I'm a shower guy, too. I have to have a daily shower. <laughs> There's a thing in the toy collecting community that some folks do called a fig bath. Where uh, and you're not supposed to actually take a bath with your figures, but it's just that you you, know, you clean your figures, you give them a little bit of a bath time somewhere. Um, there are some folks who do actually take their toys to the bathtub to clean them, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> but that, that is a thing out there. So if you're if you're doing that, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, you know, what's you is you. What's good for you is not good for everybody else. But hey, more power to you. Well, okay. So this <laughs> ends the news segment of the show because I really want to get into knowing more about you, Matthew. So that being said, you being a collector, what, I mean, this whole bath thing, like why would people need to clean their action figures? Is it because they're playing with them or just because they feel like when they're on display, they need to be cleaned often? Well, Bruce, I'm glad you asked. So sit back and get ready for a heck of a ride as I explain the joys of cleaning action figures. So uh, <laughs> there are many reasons why. Number one could be you got it from the secondary market. You may have bought a Lucy from somewhere at a flea market or online and maybe it's got a bit of a stank to it maybe it's got some dirt on it just from being so old it might have some dust on it uh or for any number of reasons it might just be dirty just from pure age so um typically you're going to want to clean it off no matter what you get for the most part these figures don't have metal parts so it's safe to do that um, but it never hurts just to kind of remove the stink remove any germs on them um you know another reason too is uh with certain star trek figures in particular um they'll get some plastic film on them from age so on my YouTube channel, I do a series called Trek Back Tuesday, where each week we review action figures from different Star Trek companies. And we just finished the Star Trek Voyager line. And Voyager is notable in particular because it had some of the worst and cheapest plastic of the entire Playmate series. So every one of those toys I got was still sealed in package, and a bunch of them had this just gross film on them. So I had to give them a bit of a dunking uh, to get them cleaned off, and even then, still not there. So... Uh, yeah, even mint on card figures can get that gross film. So cleaning is actually a pretty important part to having a nice collection. And, you know, especially if you got dust on them, that's the thing too, is if you let them sit out too long, that dust will cake out on them and it turns into this kind of like sticky film on top of it too, which is even worse than the plastic film. It just kind of is there. So you need to give them a good cleaning. So whether that's in a bathtub or with a toothbrush, and hopefully you're not in the bathtub with them, uh, you know, there's many ways to clean them, but it is important to have yourself a nice tidy collection. I have often wondered that because I've gone to people's homes where they have a whole collection of action figures, not just Star Trek, but whatever it is that they're into. And my thoughts are always just, how do you dust them? How do you keep them clean? So to your point, I guess it's not like they're just taking a Swifter and just wiping their heads necessarily. But I mean, that might be good for the short term, but you really do need to clean them on a regular basis. They got a lot of nooks and crannies in them, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm looking at Dan's uh, video feed right now. And I can see like you've got yourself a few Eagle Moss models there. And you're lucky. I only see like a handful there. Uh, so you've got an easy job. But, you know, make sure you're clean of those, mister. I'm going to be on to you if you're not. I'll, uh, I could rotate the camera and show you around the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've, got, I've got a lot. <laughs> Greed is good. You know what, yeah. Dan, as long they're, as they're, I... they're just everywhere, they're just sitting around <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> That's true because we'll be talking just like this and we'll mention the ship and he just picks one up. Like it's like all the ships are like right in like reaching distance. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> see, he's picked up another one. Got Oberth class ship. Where, where's your Enterprise C? Let's see. Now let's just start naming ships and see if we can pull it out. Uh, Enterprise C is somewhere. <laughs> oh, I think it's up here behind me. Oh, I have the prototype one and the actual one there somewhere. It's like that, that game above. show. Like, it's like that old game show. I'm looking for anybody who has themselves an Akira class starship. Who's got an Akira class starship in their pocket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make a deal. That's the, it's like that's the, the show. show. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Star Trek, that's let's the... make a deal. <laughs> 
Yeah, Dan, as long as I've been podcasting with you, I don't think I've ever seen your whole room. Oh, oh there's, there's Voyager. Voyager. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Just pulled a Voyager out of nowhere. I don't know where that Voyager came from. I don't think I want to know. No, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, Matthew, it's, do you have like, just a collection around. of Eagle Moss ships like that? I have a few Eagle Moss ships. I, I kind of prefer my ships to be a little bit bigger, so I do very much like their XL collection now. Um, but I do like the smaller ships, too. Uh, I, I have a few of the uh, Diamond Select ships also. I really, really like those a lot. Uh, I'm not really a model collector, so I prefer my ships to be already made for me. So I'm into those. Uh, for the most part, my fi- my collection is primarily action figures, and a lot of that is, like I said, the Playmates. Uh, it's a lot of the Art Asylum, Diamond Select figures. I've got uh, a few of the Mego things as well. Um, I have the only two McFarlane toys, because they only did two, unfortunately. <laughs> so that's like, in terms of produced stuff, that's, I've got a lot of that main stuff. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I've got a lot of uh, the Star Trek prototypes. That's a big thing I'm into, is like pre-production for toys. Oh, there's the McFarlane. <laughs> Dan just pulled out the McFarlane Kirk, which is uh, probably one of the better Kirks out there. Yeah, it's not bad as far as... Uh likenesses go for sure especially in the affordable range yeah it was a very <laughs> underrated line it's i mean mcfarlane if i could i could go on and on about them and just how they don't seem to care about licenses uh, it's a real pity that they had like a whole two other waves planned out basically and they cut it short for every reason i think it was a big misstep on their part um because mcfarlane was doing really nice work they were going to start making larger scale figures also they were going to make discovery figures that would have been yeah. really cool and i was really looking forward to those they were really cool. Like there are some photos out there of like uh, fact sheets showing off pictures of what they would have looked like in theory. Uh, I know they made protos of Michael Burnham in her EV suit and Spock, but those weren't really meant for public consumption. And uh, so I went to Toy Fair when they debuted the whole line and you might be able to find some leaked photos out there of this, but McFarlane was working on doing prop replicas that are affordable. So they had actually done the phasers from Discovery and they had done, which would have been really cool, uh, Kirk's rifle. <laughs> You know exactly what I'm talking about. They they actually had made a full size replica of that with lights and sounds, and none That's of those got really produced. Cool. Wait, why why haven't all these things got produced? McFarland just kind of didn't care. Uh, I mean, I've tried to get quotes on them. I'm hoping to get some hope for another project to work on later on. But um, McFarland Toys they have a habit of just picking up a license and dropping it. So Star Trek was one of those. They did it with Game of Thrones. Um, right now they're really doing a heavy push on their DC stuff. And, and their Mortal Kombat things. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy they're doing Warhammer 40K right now. And I'm happy to see that that line is continuing also to not just have like be one done figures. But for every reason, Star Trek did not do well enough for them, as they put it. And, you know, as a Star Trek collector, when I go to Toy Fair, I'll, I'll always ask companies, how come you're not doing more? Because, you know, we've got Titan merchandise. They did their line of Titan vinyls, which are little mini figures I love. Uh, Diamond Select was doing Star Trek things for quite some time. And they also just seemed to have stopped a few years ago as well. Uh, and they'll tell me that Star Trek toys don't sell that well in the long term. So like hardcore collectors like myself and like you guys will pick it up. But when they're out in the market, if there's no TV show to kind of support the release, they don't do that well. So it's a bit of a big risk for these companies. Well, I remember, was it the the McFarlane phaser? There was something with they had to the they had to make the the end of it orange, of course, to comply with whatever. And they 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 were saying that they it looked ridiculous and they couldn't do anything with it. And then it just kind of faded. Like they didn't really that might have been do their anything excuse. with that. That might have yeah. been their excuse, but I know like we've seen Diamond Select do all their phasers, and that was never an issue because uh, yeah. I think they're so far unrealistic that it's okay. Like they can get away with not having to do the orange tip thing. I think the orange tip thing is more for like realistic contemporary guns and not phasers and that kind of thing. So if that was their excuse, they're just lying. <laughs> yeah, I do remember the Diamond Select Enterprise phase pistol had a little orange tip, and I, I had a little. I also build Star Trek models, so I had a little uh, pot of uh, silver paint that worked really well to make that really not look nice so yeah they, they just did the bare minimum to get away with any legal compliance but i mean i don't think we would have had to worry about it with that giant phaser rifle from kirk yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> <All> right, yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into collecting star trek things well i think as a kid i, I remember um one of my earliest memories of star trek is actually getting that very first galoob line of star trek toys and i remember i think i got them for christmas so like that was kind of the beginning of it and uh you know that, that was probably like my I like to call myself a second generation Star Trek fan or maybe a born again fan might be a little more accurate because, you know, I was into it as a kid and growing up, I was into Star Trek. You know, I grew up in uh, the peak era of TNG and I was a fan of that. I kind of started to lose interest by the time DS9 popped up because uh, at that point, you know, it went from being primetime television to now like syndication on Sunday afternoons or early Sunday evenings. So uh, I kind of started to lose interest. And by the time Voyager came around too, I didn't really watch much of it the first time around. Uh, and yeah, Enterprise, totally. I wasn't watching any of that at that point. So, um, yeah, I would watch Star Trek here and there 
throughout the years. It would always be on. I'd always watch it, but I was never like a hardcore fan. And it was actually the toys that got me back into being a hardcore fan. So like I went to New York Comic Con, I think it was 2013. And uh, I just saw like this dude selling toys on the last day of the show. And he just wanted to get rid of them. So I saw this like box of Star Trek toys, just tons of those Playmate figures for like three bucks a piece because he just wanted to get rid of them. <laughs> so uh, I remember coming home that day with like my arms filled with, I think like two dozen Star Trek figures. And I went to my girlfriend's house. And I was like, look at this great deal. And she was like, what are you doing? Get that out of here. Uh, <laughs> so that was kind of like the beginning of me collecting Star Trek figures again and also rekindling my connection with Star Trek. Yeah, I remember listening on your podcast on one of your first episodes, your introductory episode, you talk about your fandom and watching TOS and TNG and WPIX and getting all into Star Trek and such. So fast forward to now, you've started this podcast and it sounds like you have a YouTube channel. So tell us more about that. Well, the podcast was basically an idea I'd had for a little bit of time. Uh, I think the idea for it actually came out of me going to Ghostbusters Fan Fest, uh, which I went to last year. And uh, that was like one of my favorite things ever. And I remember seeing like a lot of the celebrities that were there and, you know, didn't really think much about the time, but I was kind of realizing, I, I don't know how it came to be, but I just kind of noticed like some of them like had been in this and this and this and that. And there was like a lot of crossover between like this actor being on that show and also this show. And it kind of started to get the wheels turning in my head. And uh, the more I started watching Star Trek again, because it's been on TV a lot more in the past few years as well, like through Heroes and Icon, uh, Me TV, and of course, BBC America, it's been on a lot more. So I'm watching a lot more Trek and I'm enjoying it again. So that was kind of great to have that happen. Uh, and so basically like when the pandemic began, it kind of gave me the ability to actually start really fleshing this podcast out because I had a lot more time to do it. And it also worked out that a lot more of these folks I wanted to talk to also had a lot more time because they couldn't work at the moment. Um, so that's kind of how it began. And, and you know, you mentioned I have a YouTube channel that's Nerd News Today. I've had that channel since 2011. It's actually my second YouTube channel. And uh, this one, I'm still continuing. The other one, I retired in 2016 after about eight years. Uh, this one I've had since, like I said, 2011, almost going to the 10-year anniversary of it now. And uh, it's all sorts of nerd things. Didn't really do much Star Trek before. But again, it was the toys that kind of started to get that going. Because I have a weekly series where I review Star Trek toys called Trek Back Tuesday. And we'll review whatever, whether it's old or new. We'll start looking at Star Trek toys and merchandise from across the galaxy and time and space, as I like to say. Um, so basically these two things is kind of mashed together. I do a lot of interviews on the channel anyway. So I thought, you know, let me start an actual interview series. It'd be cool to actually get to know these people. And also, um, to kind of get to know these actors, especially, and, and these people who contributed to the Star Trek universe who don't get the spotlight because I'll talk to a lot of actors and in often cases, it's like, you know, you know, them from this and also this, 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 and that. And, you know, like for me as a Star Trek fan, I'll see on a lot of social media, people say like, oh, this guy just did one episode of Star Trek. Who is he? He's who, why is he important? He's one and done, whatever. It doesn't matter. But if you really look at who these actors were, or who these stunt performers were, the behind the scenes people, they've all done a lot of other things. They've all done a lot of other interesting things. And people don't really think about them as much because they take them for granted. They're just in an episode of Star Trek and that's all they see them in. But in reality, these people have like fully fleshed out enormous careers that if we're only looking at it from the lens of Star Trek, we don't really appreciate how much they've done and how much they've contributed to entertainment. So that was kind of like my reason to do this was, Yes, it's a Star Trek podcast, but more so it's also just kind of like an entertainment and a TV and film and sometimes theater history uh, for these actors, for these stunt performers, for whoever I'm talking to, whatever they do, whether it's music, whether it's stunts, whether it's VFX, whatever they're doing. Uh, it's about basically giving them the spotlight, giving them the appreciation that they deserve that they don't normally get. Uh, and also just letting Star Trek fans know that there's more out there besides just Star Trek and there's more to the story. Yeah, because the behind the scenes stuff is stuff it sounds like you're interested in because you have some background or or you work in production or something. Yeah, I've got a background in TV and film. Uh, I started doing that. Yeah, you know, it basically was an offshoot for my work doing the YouTube originally. Like my first YouTube channel was called The Fight Nerd and I covered mixed martial arts. So like UFC, uh, kickboxing, boxing, that kind of stuff. And that led me towards a job actually in production. So I started working for Spike TV and I began to work for them on a live TV show they had that was about mixed martial arts. And from there, I continued and I got to work on other shows with them as like associate producer. Uh, eventually, I got to write a few episodes of things also. So I got to work in essentially live television. I got to work in reality television. I got to do some scripted work as well. So I got to have, you know, a nice different amount of things in production and post-production. Uh, and in between that, also, I do my own stuff too. Like I've got my own uh, production company where I've made a few documentaries. Uh, I did my first one in 2015. Uh, I did another one in 2018 that I released and I'm working on some things now, but They've all kind of hit the back burner due to the pandemic going on right now. But uh, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of interest in making stuff and listening to stuff and just, you know, film history in general and just being part of that as well, being part of that story of, of film and cinema. So when you're 
trying to get guests on for the podcast. I'm curious as to kind of your process is, do you, do you kind of pick someone and target them and, 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 and try and get them? Or do you cast like a fairly wide net for people who have to do with Star Trek? For the most part, uh, it's typically if I'm watching an episode, I might get the inkling to like, Hey, let me see what that person is doing. Or maybe I'll see somebody post something on Facebook or on social media or, you know, Twitter or whatever. And they'll be like, Hey, remember this guy and this thing? I'm like, yes, yes, I do remember them. Let's see what they're doing today. Uh, so quite often it's a lot about just finding out that, like I'll, I'll just see something, I'll look up the person or maybe I'll just look up an episode. I'll see who was on it. And then I'll start with that. And I'll kind of try and like, you know, I, I kind of have like a criteria for what I want for a guest on the show to have. So, uh, you know, if they meet what I'm looking for with that, then I try to find, then hunt them down to see if I can find them, <laughs> which is a task unto itself. So is there, is there kind of a lot of approaching agents or do you try and approach the, uh, the person directly? In the beginning, I actually got really lucky because I, I had the help of, uh, a, what they're called as a signing agent or sometimes they're called a talent agent. And so what this person that I've talked to in particular did was he works with different actors and he gets them booked to conventions. So that was kind of how it worked out then. Um, but really I've just found that it's, if you do your due diligence, you could find a lot of these folks on your own. <laughs> And that's not to, you know, put any disparaging comments on the casting folks. They do a great job and they've been really helpful. But at this point now, um, most of the guests I've gotten have actually been on my own. And that's just from tracking them down, doing my research, trying to find out where they are. And uh, for the most part, a lot of these people are, are, that I've talked to are retired these days or they're doing other things. But they're, they're generally pretty accessible if you, if you know how to find them, if you know how to talk to them. So that's, that's kind of been the big thing. It's just it's, it's been the search for discovery, if you will, <laughs> the discovery of people and what they're up to. <laughs> So you've done at least 30 episodes at this point. So give us an idea of some of the guests that you've had on. We've got 30 published and uh, I've actually recorded another like dozen so far for next year already. And I'm hoping I'm, I'm basically trying to get as far ahead as I can because, you know, we don't know what this world's going to be like next year. We don't know if things will get worse or things will get better. I'm hoping they get better. So I'm assuming that everybody I, who I talk to is going to go back to work at some point. So I'm going to have to get myself ahead. Uh, but to date so far, uh, you know, I've had, I actually got a, yeah, I'm going to pull up the list. Give me one second. I need to, I need to remember who I've had. <laughs> like Patrick Stewart, William Shatner. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you mentioned, uh, William Shatner because I actually have talked to his original agent and I'm trying to get him on the show now. So hopefully I can actually achieve that. Um, his name is Bud Burton Moss and, uh, he's been in the industry for a long, long time. He's 90 years old right now. And he's still an agent. He still represents some of the folks he represented back in the heyday of Hollywood. So if you can believe it. Nice. Now that's a guy I would like to hear interviewed. I would, I'd like to do that too. I mean, he's actually written a few books about his career. He's been on a lot of TV shows. Um, but I mean, yeah, he was really great to talk to. I love just talking to him on the phone, in fact, and I really want to get him on, but he's just so busy, 90 years old, still repping people. And he's still too busy to talk with me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I mean, compared to like who his clientele is, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much a small fry, so I'm not really that offended. I mean, this is the guy who represents, uh, represented William Shatner, Cindy Poitier, uh, we're talking like some big, big heavy hitters in Hollywood. Wow. I know William Shatner himself has has had some comments on uh, his Twitter about uh, podcasts in general. <laughs> so if you do manage to get him, I, I, I will be very impressed that that's going to be a huge achievement. <laughs> I've been around Shatner enough Comic Cons to know that it'd be great to talk to him, but I don't really need to. So, uh, yeah, I don't need to hear him talk 30 minutes about his horses. I can live without that. <laughs> <laughs> But in terms of guests I've actually had, uh, you know, I, mean, I can just kind of run down the list here. I've had guys uh, who have been like like Harry Judge, who's on Discovery, who played a bunch of different very prosthetic heavy aliens. Uh, I've had Caitlin Hopkins, who did episodes of DS9 of Voyager. They had Deborah May, who had like a very brief Voyager appearance, but her career expands far beyond that, too. Uh, I've had Iona Morris and Phil Morris, who are brother and sister duo. They're the children of Greg Morris, who was the star of Mission Impossible. And uh, they both went on to have very large acting careers. I mean, Iona's went on, gone on to do a lot of different things. She did a lot of VO work. In fact, she did a lot of anime voiceover work before anime was cool. And Phil Morris has had an enormous career in acting. He's had like over 250 roles uh, in VO and on screen television and film. Like they both have amazing resumes. Um, I'm assuming Seinfeld came up during that discussion. <laughs> oh, of course it did. Seinfeld always comes up. Yeah, we had to talk about Jackie Childs. We could not talk about Jackie Childs. Of course. <laughs> I've had Tim Storms, who continues to be Patrick Stewart's stunt double. He's been his double since 2015. Uh, I've had the voice of Discovery, Julianne Grossman. I did listen to that episode. I thought I thought she was a lot of fun. Really interesting for sure. Yeah, I love talking to VO actors. Any chance I get to do that, I will always take it. Uh, I've talked to Michael Moore, who was the uh, master prop maker on Star Trek for like 20 years, something like that. He's been around for a long time. I've had folks in the, pretty much every series ever, original series, TNG, DS9, Voyager, Enterprise, Discovery. 
I think one of my favorites was actually uh, Scott Henze. He was the guy that sculpted all those 90s Star Trek figures. So he was one of the main guys that sculpted all his toys that I love to collect. And we had a really long discussion. I think we unearthed a lot of really unique facts about that as well. I talked to the last living composer for the original series, who's Gerald Freed. And he, again, resume like you wouldn't believe. And he was wonderful to talk to because he's still just like so sharp at his age. So sharp, so full of wit and vigor. Really, really great to talk to. Uh, I've had historians, I've had actors, I've had makeup artists like Thomas uh, Serpernon. He was another really great one because he's worked on so many other amazing films. Aside from his brilliant work in Star Trek, you know, he had a lot of stories about the Westmore family. He had stories about working on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, just so many different things. Eric Avari is another one of my favorites also because he's again a guy. Oh, I love him. (laughs) You've seen his face and everything. You might not know his name. If anybody's listening right now and doesn't know the name Eric Avari, Google it right now and you're going to be like, oh, that guy. So uh, it's kind of like one of the things I love to do with the show is remind people like, yeah, you may have seen them in this, but they were also in this, 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 and that. And their careers are so big and enormous. We don't really know how much they've done and how important, you know, especially character actors are because they really flesh out the universe. You know, like yeah. we've got our leads, we've got our Patrick Stewart's and we've got our William Shatner's, but it's always the character actors that make the shows more interesting. They add the life to it. Eric Cavari, it was funny. We talked about unification parts one and two. Uh, in the last episode, he shows up in Unification 1 under Klingon makeup. And I've been a longtime fan of Eric Avari. And the fact that he shows up there as a Klingon, you would not know to look at him. Even knowing he's Eric Avari and kind of hearing his voice, it's still through those teeth and through that makeup. You're like, is that him? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, that uh, that episode that he did for Unification Part 1, four hours in the makeup chair, 10 minutes to shoot the scene. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I believe it. Crazy. <laughs> and most recently, I just also had Max Kredenchik. Uh, I've had Chase Masterson. And uh, coming up this week, going to have Armin Schumerman, which is really, really cool. So, you know, I, I know I mentioned that the show is like meant to be the guys who are lesser known. But if I get opportunities like to talk to the first Frankie family, I'm going to take it. <laughs> oh, oh, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Max Grudenchek, I'm I'm about halfway through that episode listening right now, and uh, I'm 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 geeking out right next to you uh, listening to it. So <laughs> that was my first time using Zoom, in fact, to do any recording. So like, not only was I trying to deal with, like all the technical aspects of using Zoom for the first time, but now I'm staring face to face with Max Grudenchek, like my favorite of all time in Deep Space Nine. I think <laughs> easily one of my favorites in Star Trek as a whole, and uh, like you know, a guy who I, I love his work, I love everything he's been in, and I especially love what he did it in deep space nine as rom and now i'm trying to ask him questions face to face on zoom while all this is going on i'm just like oh my god <laughs> but you yeah, were probably you were probably already nervous before you got on the mic with him right i think i've been more nervous for max than i have anybody else and i've interviewed like you know i, I had my old mixed martial arts site i've been face to face with professional fighters who are like a foot taller than me and who could bench press me with ease and i was never intimidated by those folks but talking to rom <laughs> that's what threw me off <laughs> I feel like if I ever had the opportunity to interview or talk to Andrew Robinson, uh, who played Garrick, I would probably be blubbering and, and totally in, incomprehensible. So I, I definitely get where you're coming from there. So with that said, are there any kind of dream guests that you haven't had on that you would just absolutely, absolutely love the opportunity to speak with? A lot of those guest stars are definitely the dreams. Um, Jeffrey Combs have to have him yeah. at some point i need to get jeffrey uh, i mean yeah there's always like a lot of the big names i want jeffrey's one of them doug jones is uh, i think my number one right now who i want to get again he's a star so i'm, I'm using the, the name trek untold a little bit loosely here but i mean i have to talk to doug jones and at the very least because i can talk about so many other things besides star trek because um, you know anybody who listens to the show will know and if you haven't listened to it you'll find out that when we talk about the show really like a third of it is star trek the rest of it is i want to get to know them i want to get to know their background um, that's where the untold part comes in is learning all the parts about their past, learning about other roles. So like, for example, when I had uh, Max on, we talked about the Rocketeer and we talked about Sister Act because those things interest me. Uh, I've had a ton of actors and a ton of actresses who have done the Golden Girls. That's one of my favorites also. I love to get Golden Girl stories. Uh, and I also love to get Murder, She Wrote stories. Like anybody who's got an Angela Lansbury story, I want to know it. So, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll really go out there and we'll talk about a lot of other things besides just Trek. But yeah, Doug Jones again, because his career is so expansive beyond just Star Trek. He's done so much beautiful, amazing work. I want to learn from him. I want to get to know what he's done, get to know him better. He's one of those guys. Um, believe it or not, one of like the, my number ones right now is actually Bob Gunton. Mm, that would be an interesting one. Yeah. Now, who's that? So Bob Gunton was in season four of TNG. He was Captain Maxwell. Uh, and it's a really great episode. It's an O'Brien centric episode also, which is really nice to get to see Cole Meany in action. So you'd remember him from that if you're a Trek person. But outside of that, uh, he was in the Shawshank Redemption. He was the guy who ran the prison. 
Uh, he was he's done tons of other things. I'm trying to actually let me pull up his IMDb right now. Get it. I can list a whole bunch of things. I know this is not the most major thing, but I know he was in 24 one season. <laughs> I don't he know was. why that's popping into my head, but he was in 24. He was in Argo. He was in Boston Legal. I mean, I'm not going to run down his entire resume here, but he's been in a lot of things. Uh, he was also part of the original crew of uh, Avita on Broadway. A lot of people don't know this. He's oh, a, wow. he's actually a very good singer, and he's had a lot of his career on Broadway. So that's something else I, I would love to spend a lot of time talking about. So uh, at this moment, he's not really doing live interviews. I'm hoping that I can maybe over time melt him down and get him to come on. Uh, but yeah, he, he was actually the very first person I wanted to get on the show. And uh, his, his booking agent was like, he's not really doing much right now, but we'll see later on. So yeah, Bob's career is just amazing. And, and I want to get to know all I can about him. Because again, he's a guy, he, he did just write a book. But you know, if you don't know how to look for that book, you're not going to know how to get it. So I feel like part of my show is, is in particular helping these actors or these character actors, these stunt performers, all these people, again, who do various different things. It's putting what they do through the viewpoint of Star Trek, but also expanding it beyond that. So it's really the whole scope of their work, understanding them as a person, as an actor, and what the choices they made in life were that led them to the different things they did in these roles or whatever their profession is. That's great. Now, if somebody wants to listen to your podcast, where would they find it? So my podcast is available on pretty much every major audio platform. So if you're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, pretty much anything out there, you just search for Trek Untold and you'll find us. We're, we're uh, New episodes come out every single Thursday. Uh, appearance drops at midnight. So Wednesday, as soon as the clock turns to midnight, boom, we're live. And then on Sundays, now we do the video version since I started to do Zoom with Max Kredenchik. Uh So every Sunday, again, basically seven in the morning, Eastern time, new episode drops on video format. So you can see, so you can actually see us. We put up some B-roll clips as well of things. Uh, so that really comes in handy too. When we're talking about like more obscure roles. <laughs> so yeah, you guys can check it out that way as well. So lots of ways to check it out. And the YouTube channel is youtubecom slash today. Very very cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've I've listened to a few episodes. I'm subscribed now. I'm gonna have to definitely check out the the video version now because that sounds really enticing. <laughs> It's really cool because I've spoken to other guys, like, I guess I'll give you guys a little sneak preview, but, you know, I just spoke with uh, Armin Shimmerman this week. And one of the things to talk about is uh, we had a fan question in that episode and they asked if he took any souvenirs from the set once the show was done. And he actually shows the souvenir he got to take home. I, I won't tell you what it is. It's a really Ooh. big thing. <laughs> but he did. He actually will show us that um, coming out next year. I've got an episode with a guy named Steve Neal. And Steve was a, a makeup and a special effects person. He worked on the motion picture. He worked on a counter at Farpoint. Um, in fact, for the motion picture, he was the guy that worked on Spock's ears. And he also did the Randorite makeup for uh, for Billy Van Zandt. And so he also worked on The Stuff. He worked on Ghostbusters. He worked on Fright Night, a lot of other things. And uh, he has a lot of things that he will show us on camera that are really cool. He actually has um, one of his like favorite, one of his passions is model making. So he has this like giant replica he made of the Enterprise. And like one of them, I think, was actually in the Smithsonian for a while. Uh, so he has like one of them behind him. He has a captain's chair from the original series that he built that's behind him. So like, wow. yeah, like all this really cool stuff that I now get to actually visually show. So, you know, we, we do our best to make sure that people listening at home can also still understand what it is. Um, so, you know, we, we do it both ways for a reason, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, it's really cool now actually to have that freedom to do video because then we can show things off like that. And that's, that's really exciting for me. After COVID, I hope that you get uh, the opportunity to do on site interviews like that. So you can actually be there with those different items. I mean, yeah, it would be great to be able to go visit conventions again also, because that's the other thing. Like, for anybody out there who wants to do this kind of thing also, you know, once conventions open up again, I recommend you guys go to more cons. And if there's a person you want to talk to, just go up to them, let them know what you're doing, and ask if you could talk to their agent or their rep. Never, never ask for their information. Always ask for their agents. Um, but yeah, like once cons open up, I'll be doing that myself a ton. And I would love to do more in-person stuff because it's so much better in person. Like when I'm, when I'm doing these things through Zoom, it's always just so distracting because I'm always worried about, oh, is my mic on? Is this off? Uh, did I turn off this chat right now? Do I need to mute myself? There's always like so many other things I need to concern myself with. But when you're like face-to-face -face in person, there's just a totally different chemistry you have with people. And it's just way easier. Like you know, I've done a lot of documentaries. Uh, it's one of the things I do outside of the podcasting stuff as I make documentary films. And a big part of like getting a good interview is being able to connect with a person. And yeah, I mean, we can do it through Zoom, but being face to face, being in the same room with a person, it's such a different energy that you get. It's it's easier to feel a person out, understand things about them. So, I mean, I, I really want to do more things in person. I'm hoping that when the opportunity arises, that yes, I will totally be doing more of that stuff. Okay, well, I'll be looking for you at the conventions to see you there doing all that stuff. Do you have you ever gone to STLV? I'm hoping to try and do it this year, but I don't know. Still, I'm still a little bit hesitant. I know they're trying to do it, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, I've only actually been to one Star Trek convention ever, and that was the one in New York in 2016, Star Trek Mission New York. 
And uh, that was a lot of fun, actually. Like that was again, like me kind of getting in a little bit deeper into things. Um, so that was my first Star Trek con and also my girlfriend's first Star Trek convention. And so like, she's a super nerd. She watches like Supernatural, Doctor Who, Firefly, that's her stuff, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but Star Trek was something like she always wanted to get into, but never did. So basically to prep for the convention, in the span of less than six months, she watched every single Star Trek show ever. <laughs> oh, wow. Dang. That's yeah. impressive. And I'm talking original <laughs> animated series. Yeah, even the animated series, uh, TNG, DS9, Voyager, and Enterprise. Watched them all the way through. So yeah, she was way up more update than I was that event. That's for sure. <laughs> very cool. Wow. But you, yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm very impressed too. So I'll see both of you guys at a convention. But if we don't see a Jake convention, where can people follow you online? If anybody wants to check out what we do on Trek Untold social media, go ahead and look us up at Trek Untold. And it's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Well, thank you, Matthew, for joining us. I really appreciate it. I didn't even know we would get into collecting, which is great, because I think it also, to bring up Threshold, didn't they come out with action figures for that? There is a figure of Paris as the lizard. It's uh, it's actually starting to go up price a little bit, and that might be because of the Delta Flyers. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's a long-term investment to bank on for your future retirement, but uh, it's a good figure to have. I mean. That's kind of the cool things about those Playmates figures. They did a lot of obscure stuff. I do have one on uh, the back shelf in one of my rooms here. I, ha- I have that figure. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I don't have a really comprehensive collection of like all the figures, but I do have a few here and there. And that, for whatever reason, is one of them. I think I also have Seska as a Cardassian somewhere. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Do you, do you have a favorite? Oh, man. Uh, whew. That's a good question. I, I, I really like, of course, the main crew and that kind of thing. I think I, I had a Q figure, a Q in his judge's robes I really liked, mm, I think. So yeah, I'm not a big collector a at all. I've got just a few, and I mean really just a few action figures, but my favorite is Captain Mackenzie Calhoun because he's based on a character from the novels. And that was the Mailway exclusive, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. That's a good yeah. one too, yeah. I have that <laughs> That's one. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan, when you're not bathing your action figures, where can people find you online? (laughs) Well, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. Also on Instagram at Kurtrats47. I will not be posting any photos of bath time with uh, action figures, but uh, I'll leave that to everyone's imagination. Uh, You can also find me on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And Kurtrats is just Star Trek backwards. Excellent. And you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex and on Instagram at just Admiral Rex. And you can find me occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast. If you want to send us an email, just send to PositivelyTrek at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at PositivelyTrek and look for our Facebook group. And Matthew, again, thank you so much for joining us. We will be tuning into your podcast and to your YouTube channel to check things out. So keep staying positive there, Matthew. Oh, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me on. I really am grateful for the time you give me today. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to see me taking a fig bath, just go to OnlyFans.com slash Trek Untold. <laughs> uh, that's a little dangerous, but yeah, maybe we'll check that out. Yeah. <laughs> At least you're clothed, right? You're not in the bathtub with it. Depends what, how much you're paying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that being said, everybody, we'll see you next time. And knowing that information, still try to stay positive. Stay positive.